One point about the BLT is that from its site in Chile, you have access to the southern sky. And some of the most interesting objects are in the far south, so from England they are inaccessible. Well, Chris has been there, and he's had time to look round the wonders of the far southern sky. It's nearly nightfall, and the sun's setting over the desert behind me, as the professional astronomers up at the VLT are settling down in front of their computers for a night's observing. But what really excites me on this trip is the chance to see the sky for the first time from south of the equator at this superb site. We're looking forward to sights such as Orion seen overhead, beautiful views of Saturn and deep sky objects like Omega Centauri and the large Magellanic Cloud that we never get to see from the UK. It's going to be a stunning night. And with me are some of the world's leading astrophotographers. Damien Peach from the UK is responsible for some of the most stunning images of the planets I've ever seen. And for local knowledge, with me is Belgian astronomer Daniel Versace, who's lived in Chile for more than five years. We've chosen a site just 100 metres below the VLT. And coincidentally, it's the site for ESO's newest telescope, VISTA. When completed, it will be the largest telescope anywhere in the world dedicated to large-scale surveys of the night sky, in this case, both in the optical and the near-infrared regions of the spectrum. We're trying to do as much of the setting up as possible during daylight hours, because here, literally within sight of the VLT, restrictions on light are incredibly tight. In fact, it's rare for anyone to be allowed to bring telescopes up here, so it's a real privilege for us this evening. Daniel, of course, has driven up from the south of the country, but Damien's managed to pack a surprising amount of kit into his airline luggage. So, Damien, you bought your telescope out from England despite the excess baggage, um, but you've had to make some adjustments to it. That's right, Chris. Uh, the polar axis actually needs uh, adjusting because we're much closer to the equator here at uh, Paranel. Where at the poles of the Earth, the polar axis of the telescope would be pointing directly at the zenith, and it would actually track the sky around in a circle. As you move further towards the equator, the lower the axis points, until eventually when you reach the equator, the, the axis would actually be horizontal. And here at Paranel, the, the latitude is about 24 degrees, uh, which is uh, about 25 degrees different from uh, back in England. And uh, I know you're planning to, to look through it, um, but you're also planning to do some imaging today. So tell us about the, the camera you've got to do that. Um, I've actually brought along two webcams for uh, imaging of the planet, um, a black and white uh, webcam and a colour webcam. Uh, of course, the, the webcams remain uh, the most powerful tools for high-resolution imaging of the planets, and uh, what better place to exploit it? So I know you're looking forward, as I am, to the southern sky, but what are you going to look at first? Well, of course, I'm completely spoilt for choice here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I think my first object will probably be, probably be the uh, Magellanic Clouds, as I've never seen them before. Well, you'll have to fight me for the eyepiece, <laughs> but thanks for bringing it all out. Yeah, of course. While Damien's imaging will focus on the planets, Daniel has other targets in mind. We're looking at uh, an object in Orion. Uh, it's commonly called the waterfall. It's a very small, dim um, star forming region and it's close to uh, a nebula that's better known uh, which is called NGC 1999. Um, it's just south of the uh, Orion nebula which okay. means up here, it's, it's above the uh, Orion nebula. So these are all part of the same star forming complex exactly. in reality? Yes, exactly. So yes. how did you come to pick that one object? Well, uh, I figured um, having traveled a long way and uh, not being able to take a very large uh, or long focus telescope, uh, we're, we're talking here uh, 1100 millimeters, um, and still trying to do something in high resolution, uh, this is like an object that matches both things. You need a reasonable focal length, and hopefully with the seeing we're, we're going to get this, uh, tonight, we will still get a good resolution on that one. And as well as the telescope, you've, you obviously need a great camera, so tell us about what you're holding yes. in your, your hands. Uh, we're going to be using a, a, a six-inch telesco te telescope by Astrophysics. Uh, it's a refractor and an ST10 uh, digital camera. It's a CCD camera with very small pixels, uh, again, for the resolution. Okay, and you create colour pictures in an interesting way. Correct. Uh, we will take uh, a sequence of probably five to six pictures in each color, that's red, green and blue, and then probably eight to ten pictures in luminance, that's the white light. 
and then add them together in the computer. And then in the computer everything gets mixed up together with a little bit of salt and pepper and we get a nice picture. Yeah. Fabulous. Now you've travelled all over Chile, you've lived here, and um, how does this observing site compare? We'll be able to tell tomorrow, but from the looks of it, it looks fantastic. Yeah? We are very close to the ocean, uh, it looks like the seeing is going to be marvellous, the wind is dying down, so everything looks like it's going to be uh, uh, real fun tonight. And of course, the other advantage for us of having you here is we need a local guide to the sky. I've never seen the Southern <laughs> Cross, let alone the faint fuzzies, as of now. So maybe you should tell us about a few of the, the objects in the Southern Sky that we won't know about. Sure. I, I mean, well, I'm Belgian myself, so I, I needed some time to, to, to find my way around the skies. And sometimes I'm, I'm still looking a little bit upside down to find my way. But yes, uh, the, the main uh, highlights, of course, are the Mag Magellanic clouds. The, uh, they are in, uh, deep in the deep in the south. Uh, then we will have some, some other nice goodies like the... Um, the 47 Tuk, which is a very nice globular cluster. We will see Omega Centauri, although it's a little bit low in the sky at, at this time of the year. And uh, if we start early, we will have uh, still a nice view of the Milky Way uh, heading towards the west. The Magellanic Clouds are our galaxy's most obvious neighbours. Two small dwarf galaxies, they orbit the centre of our own Milky Way. And each time they pass through, gas and dust is being stripped from them. In fact, our galaxy is actually cannibalizing them. It's three hours after sunset, and with the moon above the horizon, it's still one of the clearest and darkest views of the sky I've ever had. And we're using a night vision lens to try and give you a flavor of what we can see from this remarkable sight. Daniel and Damien are still hard at work setting up their telescopes and cameras, but let's interrupt and get a tour of the southern sky. So let's start with the familiar parts of the sky, but there's something very odd about Taurus. Uh, yes, absolutely. We're, we're seeing it completely upside down from how we usually see it in, in England. And the whole perspective of the sky is completely changed and very difficult to get used to. <laughs> yeah. The very distinct Pleiades cluster is really quite, quite uh, stunning to see. Mm. And there's at least 12, 13 stars visible with at the least. naked eye in the cluster. So again, that's a, it's a really good indication of quite how good a sight this is. Absolutely. And of course we have, we have Orion pointing at a, a very odd angle toward the horizon. Yeah, the sword's hanging upwards from yes. the belt. With <laughs> yes. the, the nebula, the, which you can see is the, the second star, is, is obvious with the naked eye. It's obvious it's, there's something going on. Yeah. You can see the, right. the nebula. And Sirius is also uh, in the Canis Major there. He's upside down. Yeah, it's interesting. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, always seems to really stand out at home through the, the murk and the oh, fog. But yeah. here it's bright, but it's not noticeably bright in some of the other... Then if we go more south, we go in the direction of the Magellanic clouds, which right. of course are not visible from Europe. I can't believe how large on the sky they are. Yeah, They are absolutely remarkable to see for the first time. Uh, but they're obvious with the naked eye. How do they look in binoculars and in a telescope? Well, binoculars are fantastic for looking at these objects and, of course, one object that I can't help but mention is the spectacular globular cluster 47 Ducane, which we've uh, enjoyed absolutely stunning views of uh, this evening. It's also my favourite one. The interesting uh, thing about the Ma uh, Magellanic Clouds is that uh, each one has a highlight. Uh, close to the smaller one is uh, 47 uh, Tucana, uh, just mentioned. And uh, on the edge of the other one, of the large Ma Magellanic Cloud, is the Tarantula Nebula, which also, uh, is also a highlight in a Dobsonian or, or plain binoculars. It's also where the nearest supernova to be detected in recent times went off in 1987, right, was, right. was in that region. Further down to the South Pole over there, Octans. It's remarkable with the pole quite how empty a region of sky that is. Of, there's no bright stars there at all. That's po yes, polar aligning is... Uh, we, don't re we are so lucky to have Polaris <laughs> in the UK. We really are. <laughs> We've also got the nearest large galaxy in the sky. On the, the other side, moving back round towards the north, there's Andromeda. Yes. Uh, it's... It, it's completely, uh, again, a different perspective uh, than we see it from uh, in England. But th the incredible dark skies here at Paranel make it such an easy object to see, even with the naked eye.
I've always said that you can tell how good a site is by counting the number of stars you can see inside the square of Pegasus, and I lost count at around 30, <laughs> which I suppose answers the question. So although we've bought all the equipment up here to get the best possible view, you can do a lot of decent astrophotography with some very simple equipment, like this camera here. Absolutely, Chris. It's, you don't need expensive equipment to uh, photograph the night sky uh, like we have here. Especially when conditions are this good. Absolutely. It's, it's an ideal tool. So um, what sort of thing are you using this camera for? Um, I'm using this uh, SLR camera to take um, long exposures of the constellations to uh, capture them in uh, detail. Right, it's no motor or anything? No, it's basically a stationary tripod with the camera and simply a cable release and uh, shooting one or two minutes of exposures. So what have you been pointing it at so far this evening? Well, of course I've been pointing it primarily at the objects that uh, I've never seen before, such as the uh, Magellanic Cloud. And they're so large that actually this sort of system has a huge advantage over a telescope. Absolutely. One of the great advantages with this system is you have a large field of view, which means you can capture such objects as the Magellanic Clouds uh, perfectly. And so what sort of exposures are you using? Um, with this camera, typically uh, around five minutes exposures will uh, give a very nice image. Right, but if you leave it open for longer, you if, get an interesting effect. Of course, you, you get a very interesting effect in that if you leave it open for long enough, you will get uh, star trails. Yeah, as the Earth rotates, we see the stars move, and on the camera, that appears as a trail across the film. Of course, yes, uh, and of course, the, the ultimate place to point it at for this effect is the uh, polar regions of the sky, where you can get uh, a very nice trailing effect. How are things going? Uh, fine, actually. Uh, the, the wind is bothering a little bit, but uh, the seeing is good and the transparency is good. And we just got the first image of the field. We, we just got the first image of the field. Um, I'm brightening it oh, wow. right here now, so we see the nebula coming through. You can see the waterfall quite clearly. The waterfall is coming out. We can do a, a quick first calibration on it. Right. Just... Yeah. Oh. And you've lost all the... Wow, that's an amazing so, image already. Yes, but it's only one single frame and it's still very noisy. Of course. What we have to do now is collect more frames. In different filters. In different filters and of the same filter as well. And then we will stack those uh, different frames and get rid of the noise. And end up with our full colour image. Exactly. I have to say, it's, I can't believe the detail on that. There's so much nebulosity. Going on, right? Absolutely. Uh, this area here is uh, NGC 1999. The waterfall and this one is a nice herbic harrow oh, wow. object okay. in red. Yeah, that's amazing. How long was this exposure? This was 15 minutes, and so wow. we, we, we're going to use about uh, 20 shots. Okay. Well, we should let you get on with it. Okay. Good. If I look at the small Magellanic cloud through binoculars, it's an amazing sight. But there's a smaller patch of nebulosity just next to it. it seems very concentrated. Can't quite make out any anything any structure in it. You got it in the telescope? Um, I certainly have, Chris. Uh, and this object is uh, the globular star cluster, 47 Tucane. Uh, and the view is absolutely magnificent. Yes, of course, the binoculars show it, but they don't show any of the individual stars. What about the telescope? Here in the telescope, you can actually, look. You can actually see the cluster resolved into a many thousands wow. of individual stars. That's... That looks almost as if you put a photo of it on the end of the <laughs> telescope. That's absolutely incredible. Could, you could still see the very strong central cluster. Yes, it's, it's very concentrated towards uh, the core. I mean, tens of thousands of stars in this object. It's almost a mini galaxy, but because it's close enough, you can actually see the stars. And then there seem to be some lanes. If you have a look in the outer regions... Um, where you can resolve the stars. They seem to be almost concentrated into lanes. Absolutely, Chris. I, I can also see these, uh, and they radiate out from the, the core of the cluster. Yeah, it's not something I'd seen. We have a couple of bright globulars in the northern hemisphere that we can see um, from, from the UK, but nothing like the resolution of this, nothing like the size of this one. It's incredible. It's an absolutely amazing object compared to... The M13, the, the best globular cluster we can mm. see from England, it, it really, 47 Tucane, sh shines above it. Yeah, and of course it's ideal for, for small telescopes because you need the field of view 
um, a bigger telescope would magnify in and you'd miss the, the splendour of the whole thing. It's, that, it's just incredible. Absolutely amazing. It's 2 a.m. and with the Southern Cross and Ita Carina rising behind me, I'm going to call it the end of a fabulous night's observing up here on the mountain and leave Daniel and Damien to get on with their hard work. I can't wait to see the results in the morning. We should have some truly stunning photographs of this beautiful sky. Certainly, Chris was enjoying the southern sky. I'm sure that I wasn't there too. So now, on to the great new telescopes.